Are you a physician who wants more autonomy in how you practice or fulfillment in your life? If so, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Change Physician Podcast, where you too can learn the mindset, skills, and strategies to create the life you want without selling your morals or values. I'm your host, Dr. Kevin Cucaro, and I'm joined with my co-host, Dr. Melissa Katie. And today we're going to be talking about Dr. Katie's personal journey of transformation and how she became a change physician. So I'm excited for this episode. I get to grill my co-host here. I'm hoping you're excited for this episode. Uh, I think we're all going to learn something from it. So Dr. Katie, thanks for coming to the podcast today. Of course, as always. All right. So let's go back to the beginning here. And what were your reasons to go into medicine? Why did you choose to go into healthcare and specifically medicine? Well, I wasn't that kid that said that I want to be a doctor from the very beginning. That's for sure. Um, Really, truly, I went into college, just going to college, doing the next thing. And it's probably my last year of college that I decided I was going to apply for medical school. And I think the biggest thing that drove me in that direction was I was already a personal trainer and was working part-time while I was in college um, to make a little money. And I had a couple of clients that had, one had some heart condition and one had some pain issues, back pain issues. And I felt a little nervous taking care of them because I didn't really know like all the things that I thought I needed to know to make sure I kept them safe. (laughs) So that was part of it. I was also an athlete in the sense of playing a lot of, um, not necessarily professional sports, but was, was playing up to that time through most of my years before college and, and a little bit in college. I was, I was playing a lot of sports and had this uh, physical orientation. I really loved like changing the body with weights and found that very gratifying and, and learning kind of through experience how the body can adapt. And then I thought about being a massage therapist, thought about going to a school for public health, was really just trying to do things that I felt like directly impacted people's health. And so um, ironically, I was around the time of trying to figure out getting into massage therapy school. And I decided I wanted to, to go to medical school just to enhance my knowledge, to know. I guess that was the biggest thing. And then that's the conscious part of it. What I think is revealing looking back now that I have this hindsight is that there was probably a subconscious element that was driven by society and or family of what was valued or what would be a smart thing to do or what would be admirable. And so I chose to go to medical school and uh, that was, that was my predominant reason. Um, What's interesting is that I did apply and I had applied to uh, DO and MD schools. Uh, The DO school was separate from all the MD schools but I got into UT Houston, which would be an MD degree. And then I got into the DO school in Fort Worth, with, you know, osteopathic school, which would be a DO. And because of my mindset of loving musculoskeletal stuff as a, someone who's very physically oriented, um, I thought this little extra skill set of osteopathy uh, or just osteopathic manipulative medicine or therapy or treatment, whatever you want to call it, would be like a cool skill to have. So even though I could have been an MD, I'd already gotten accepted. I chose to be a DO um, because I felt like it was that blend of being a massage therapist and being an MD. So oh, that's why. Yeah, that's good. And, and uh, so what did you hope or think you'd accomplish while you were pre-med? What, did, what, did, what were your expectations of medicine? I think most of my expectations were of me. <laughs> Okay. Literally, like I think it was about me knowing, and of course, all of this without me saying in that first question is that I like helping people, you know, making a difference. And um, I'm definitely, there's, I think, a little bit of a pleaser um, type of tendency, and, and that probably played into it as well. Um, so my expectations were that I'm going to learn how to do things or help people and, and it's going to make a difference. And, and I think that's important though to, to again, 
reiterate though is so many people go into medicine in healthcare, but specifically to be a physician is because they want to help people. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I'm not sure if the public gets that all the time. Cause I think a lot of people think that they go into to make millions of dollars and play on the golf courses or whatever. And there are very few physicians that end up doing that. Um, so it's, it, I think it's, it's good to be very specific because I know you and you definitely yeah. want to help people. And it's just it, it's an interesting path though, because you let this external expectations as well mm-hmm. kind of shape how you could help other people. So I'm sure there are other listeners out there that have been in that dynamic where where the expectation, the initial choice may have been framed as much or more by other people in their family or friends. Um, but yeah, it's. But if you asked me then if there was any influence, I would have immediately denied that. <laughs> I would have literally said, this is my thing, this is my agenda, and this is what I'm going to do. And my practical mind too was. There's always a job in medicine. I will not have to worry about a roof over my head. I will be able to make sufficient income, but it was never, I'm going to be a millionaire or it had never gotten to that level. It was always about, I'm going to feel secure in my income where I can help others while helping myself. Yeah, no, I think and that makes it, it, it too, it, it's interesting. And it's also interesting how when we look back in time, we could say, well, actually, there was probably a more of an influence than I was willing to admit <laughs> than not. So, yeah. all right. So you're going into, me, into medical school. You, you've chosen mm-hmm. to, to go into an osteopathic medical program. Mm-hmm. Um, and you had these ideas of helping people and then pulling in the hands, you know, the, the hands-on skills. Did your expectations change during medical school or residency? Mm, no, but I started having a, a, a challenge with myself as always, even with sports that I had in the past where I loved everything. I'm very inquisitive. I'm very curious. I always want to learn more. So I always spread myself in many directions and I had a hard time choosing one thing. Um, and so I never really had like my expectation of where I was going from that point um, after medical school was um, like for a lot of medical students is, is quite stressful because you only get like a, a thumbnail version of, of what to expect and, and you don't have the perspective to see it within the confines of the medical system unless you're really good at stepping back with that bird's eye view and being reflective. And the problem with me more so then than now that is always a challenge at times. I had a really hard time with, with just, it was always about tasking and doing and getting the next thing done. And even the way we're trained in medical, the medical school is that you can't, you can't sit there and like dwell on the, the test before, like literally every week you're having like some kind of test and you've got to just keep churning and burning through everything without much reflection at least it's not forced upon you to be reflective. And so unless you've had that built into you to be reflective of your life, you know, let alone your career, um, you know, you, you miss out on the opportunity to really um, truly listen and understand and know who you are, which that's a critical piece to my journey. That's a great point. Like we, we kind of ignore that, that once you once you enter that pathway and you hit the ground in medical school, it sucks you down, mm-hmm. and it really. So that's a great point that that um, we you don't have a chance to be aware because you're just trying to survive till the next test in so many yeah. ways. That's that treadmill. It's like you feel like or that you know that gerbil in the you know running wheel or or not gerbil but mouse in the running wheel. So when okay, so you're you're getting pulled down this pan this 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 the gerbil hamster wheel of medical school and (laughs) and clinical rotations and things yeah um when when did you uh when did you become aware that maybe something didn't line up with your initial expectations or did things line up with your initial expectations so it's interesting how we create memories and and trying to look back on what we I mean, what we really thought or what we were really doing back then, that could be another conversation. But on when I think back to moments that probably accrued over time to build up um, my moments of change later, uh, even back as an athlete, 
I recognize adaptive change of the human body and the capacity to heal and challenging it. You know, hence I call myself the challenge doctor because I really believe we build resilience and all those things. And then, you know, the osteopathic philosophy does kind of like has this, the four principles that kind of talk about that, but MDs that understand the human body and are reflective understand that too, <laughs> you know, good physicians get that, yeah. um, you know, those moments. And then I had like significant back pain where I couldn't tie my shoes in medical school. And then the things that I learned weren't helping me. Other people, I had to go to another person and it was, it, they weren't even dealing with the area that I was hurting, but somehow I was getting better with some things they were doing completely like remote to the area that I thought was the problem. And so that was just kind of a moment. Of course, I'm still in my mindset of next thing, next thing, you know, you don't really sit there and think about it too much. But I think there was a little bit of a, wow, there's other ways of doing things beyond just what I learned within the confine of this building of medical school or some of my rotations. I went to some seminar outside of the medical school with an osteopathic physician that approached things a little differently and got some results for whatever reason, you know, that reflecting later, I realized maybe really what was going on. Um, but that was my, probably the thing that shifted then was just this idea of there are many ways of approaching patient care. It's not just what you're taught. So now you're, you're going through medical school you you're experiencing back pain finding that there are many different ways to do things what happened next like what was with residency or fellowship or early practice what was what was the 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 kind of the the moment when you're like hey something needs to change here or recognizing that there should there needed to be a change in your life or how you practice medicine well let's just say that there's a few things that transpired along with my uncertainty with what to do. <laughs> I liked everything in my rotations. Internship is a perfect example. So I, I end up finishing my medical medical school, do a year of general surgery, not because I wanted to do general surgery, but because I had limited myself to two places to do possibly interventional radiology or uh, really that's what I was focused on. But you have to understand on my personal life, I was in an unhealthy marriage that was distant. You know, we're living in two different cities and I was limiting my options based on that person and where we could potentially live together. And I didn't get into the, the radiology, radiology uh, internship residency. Uh, I was basically a residency. But so I took, I said to scramble, talk about, I still remember the feeling, the pit in my stomach of scrambling, just hoping to get something because we know we can't go work at Whataburg and pay off these loans. <laughs> I had, I had over a hundred thousand plus, you know, in debt. So I, which is not nearly as bad as some people I've met now, like you have mentioned. Um, so I do a year in San Antonio in general surgery, and then I try to get in radiology again. <laughs> and then I end up deciding, well, just in case this doesn't work out, I'll get a categorical spot, which obviously means that I could just keep staying there. So I did an internal medicine internship in Temple, Texas. So north of Austin, where it was like, kind of like my base. And so I did a year of general surgery and a year of internal medicine, two internships. I mean, that's just insane. <laughs> But I was just trying to like keep myself in training and it wasn't, it's, it's not because you couldn't necessarily get into something else, but I was being very, like, I was limiting my options based on my relationship, which was not healthy at the time. So I end up discovering during general surgery, that first internship, I discovered anesthesia and because they would come around and deal with the code blues. And I was like, God, it's so cool. Like, to be able to do something like that and like help people when they're like about to die on you. Like that just sounds like so gratifying. But the thing that also I realized was whether it was general surgery or internal medicine, I was, I didn't like just writing orders. Like I want to know how to do that. Like that was the thing that bothered me the most and nurses knew how to do it. And nurses have to go through some rigorous training as well. And they get to learn all these skill sets that I don't know how to do. 
and it really bothered me. <laughs> so, so I'm like, I want to put that NG tube in. Like, you know, I didn't even know what that was when I started my general surgery internship. That's how unprepared I was for general surgery. I mean, I was like, it was so embarrassed. It was the most looking back. It was just to me at the time it was a challenge, you know, and, but it was stressful, but I was used to being stressed. So I, I literally was in a place where I just wanted to feel like as a physician, I know how to do these things. If I was on an airplane and something happened to somebody, I want to be able to do the most basic things and not be like, I'm the physician, but I don't know what to do. Like, you know, this has happened to plenty of physicians, but anyway, so I've realized that during those two internships, I had already connected with the anesthesia department. So they offered me a spot in anesthesia. Of course, when I was in internal medicine, they said, if I don't get into anesthesia, I can stay there. So I had both, I got both places that are willing to like, let me be there working. Um, so I got an anesthesia and I did, you know, my three years after two internships, <laughs> finally figuring out what to do, even though I was still considering orthopedic surgery and physical medicine and rehab. And like, I really, and I had people interested. I mean, it was insane. Like there even pathology, I did a rotation pathology and I was like, well, I don't think I can deal with the microscopes. It's just, you know, it's really cool learning this stuff and doing some biopsies, but no, I can't, I can't deal with the microscope. So I loved everything to a certain extent and anesthesia felt like the perfect blend of you could spend time and really truly care one-on-one -on -one with a patient, whether you want to do that in ICU or something like that. But in the OR, like you have said previously, there's a working together there and it's about safety of the patient and, and just doing your job well. And and so I was able to learn the skill sets that I felt like equated with being a physician. While many nurses actually do, you know, a lot of anesthesia work as well, uh, whether in a team model or not, it gave me the opportunity to do a lot of those things. So um, I didn't have to write orders. I could just do it myself <laughs> and, and be in control of, of how it's being delivered. Um, and so there, there is an art to when you first meet someone and, and making sure that they feel comfortable and, and safe with you and trust you. It's a very vulnerable time for people. And I take that job very seriously. And so did that. And then I realized that pain medicine um, was an option during my anesthesia training and then recognized, man, this pain medicine, you know, consult team, that's really cool to take away someone's pain like that. You know, at least that was my initial <laughs> thought. <laughs> so I'm like, well, so here's where the, I'll just tell you the next step of what happened here. So I'm obviously in a, in a, I was with someone for 13 years, married 10 technically was not in a healthy relationship and realized I needed to get out of this relationship. That was at the end of my anesthesia residency. And the reason I bring up my personal stuff is because it tremendously impacted the next course or next phase of my life. And I did know that course it'd be great to go out and finally start paying off your loans and you know live your life but I think I knew once I got out of training I wasn't going to go back like at least not in a um, official type of regimen of one year at this salary once you start making a certain amount it's hard to go back at a lower rate unless you just truly believe that's what you have to do so I was like oh well why not I'm going to be single. I'm just going to, you know, enjoy this next year. I had like a three month gap after my last year of anesthesia. I got divorced, had a little sabbatical, had three months off before my pain fellowship was actually starting, worked as faculty doing anesthesia, helping out, you know, uh, with people I already knew. So it was, it was really great. But then I ended up in my pain medicine fellowship with a renewed sense of really what is what do i want my life to look like and i felt like a, such a weight lifted off of me where i was finally i guess i just didn't i didn't want to i didn't want to be too committal like overly committed on anything um i finally had freed myself of something that probably i shouldn't have been in for all those years but it, it made me who i was and i've learned from those things but i think i was the first time in my life started evaluating and reflecting, maybe not quite as much if I had been helped and trained to do that, but I think I was a little bit more aware that 
okay, some decisions you make are like really big decisions and they have this insidious impact on your overall soul. Um, and, and it's not just the work, but my personal relationships can eat at your soul. And so I had already experienced 13 years of eating away at my own soul. And then I go into a pain fellowship and learning stuff that I was starting to question. So that, that catches you up to speed to the pain medicine. I know I've been rambling. No, that, but that makes sense because again, people get this impression that they're, they become trapped by, they track from a decision from years ago, right? So there's physicians that, that feel honestly trapped by that initial decision to go into medicine. And now they're thinking it's six years down the line, two, eight years down the line, 10 years down the line. And they're feeling more and more trapped saying, what am I doing with this? And it's just, so it's interesting to hear that, that that doesn't have to be the only one. Right? There are other decisions that we make that can be life-changing, that can have significant impact. And, and I think that this fits into the change physician is just to recognize that there's always a choice. Mm-hmm. And so you had, you know, in your, in your relationship, that was a big one because that's another huge impact. But it just sounds like that, that, that recognition of choice, that you have an active choice that you can make. It may not be an easy choice, but you have one just happened to hit at that threshold of moving into a pain medicine fellowship and lined up then with, with what your experiences when it came to what were the true outcomes when it came to pain. So I, I think that's, you know, I applaud that. And I think, I think others people need to recognize that it becomes so difficult to recognize that you have the power of choice when you're feeling trapped, when you're feeling stressed, when you're doing the, you know, what did you call it? The, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, you know, <laughs> it was all lined up for there. Um, but just take a moment is, you know, if you pause for a second and just look and, and uh, def- just, rec- you know, again, you always have a choice. It may not be an easy one, but there isn't always a choice there. And I think that's really crucial that people understand that. And it's uh, so good to hear that. So to get, good to hear about yours because I, get, I guarantee yeah. you that was, you know, not only that was, that's a hard one. I mean, we're, we haven't even talked about family or anything like that, but that's a tough choice to make at that moment in time while you are still technically in the training environment. Right. Well, let me be honest, you know, a few things there is that when I look back on what held me from even getting out of a relationship that wasn't healthy, first of all, I think I made myself believe that the things that were wrong in the relationship were okay. And that I want to be, as the pleaser, always trying to make sure the other person's happy and not recognizing my own personal needs. But there's also the flip side of, you know, I got married younger than probably my parents wanted me to get married. And there's this self-preservation and this ego and this um, stubbornness that you aren't willing to let go. And you're willing to fight the pain and the suffering and the, the chipping away at your soul, despite all that. And it's not a healthy place to be. And I feel very confident saying it like that now because in in reality, it's true. I didn't want to admit to that at the time I was going through it. There are several people in different environments that were trying to hint at me, to me, that this was not what I needed to be in. And I didn't listen to it. My belief was this is the decision I made and this is what's going to stay. And I don't want to be divorced and all these things that go through your head. And I, I, even though it sounds like, oh, this is just a personal relationship, like, no, this is the mindset and the reality of even what we can do when we're in a medical field and perhaps in, in a career or a job that really is not well suited for us, which pretty much, you know, sets me up for my next phase. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and that's a, another good point because so many people, again, will feel I've made this decision. I made, uh, I have to commit to it. It's just the yeah. way it is. Well, as you touched on, if it's the cost of your soul, is, is that right? You know, that, right. And um, yeah, and then we, we talk about that probably in future episodes, like limitations, these self-imposed limitations that we make. So, yeah. All right. So you go into pain fellowship. You've gone through this major life tra- tra- transition during training. You're entering your pain fellowship now. Um, and then you're deciding that, you know, how I want to practice, how, what I'm seeing doesn't necessarily... You, you took the first step that a lot of change physicians learn much, much later on in their journey was, <laughs> wow, I have control over my life. I can start designing my life and practice that mm-hmm. I want to be in consciously, you know, awareness and conscious decision-making. 
so what was the plan that you created? How, how then did the next, next step occur? So it's probably good to reflect on the fact that I saw half the number of patients as all my pain fellows in my pain fellowship. And we'd spend twice the amount of time with patients. And I would tend to favor the non-injection, non-interventions <laughs> because of the skill sets that I had developed, whether I had the correct attributions for why they worked or not. I was trying to compel and convince. I wouldn't say I was the best motivational interviewer at the time, but people knew I cared and they, I gave them time. And so certain people responded to it and would get better without the in in injections or other procedures. And I would even have, and I won't ever forget this patient who went through everything, even the things like injecting into their disc, like I did that to him. And all these things that, you know, oh, well, maybe, uh, maybe it was better. I don't, you know, really nothing convincing. And then I didn't see him forever. And he comes back and I ask, you know, man, you look so good. What happened? And he said, I fell in love. And I'm just like, okay, that's not the answer I was thinking, <laughs> you know, like, there was these moments where I think of it's not as concrete as we make it to be. And I even had, had a conversation. I wouldn't call it a disagreement, but kind of, I was trying to understand why even in the literature and I wasn't the best evaluation of, you know, evaluator literature, but I was looking at, well, they're making assumptions based on the diagnoses, but the diagnoses are not specific. They're like, post, you know, uh, what do you, uh, failed back su surgery syndrome. I'm like, well, that doesn't, like, that doesn't make sense. Well, they, they take account for that in the, you know, the, the, um, oh, the numbers that they do. I don't know. They, they try to, you know, account for this and this and do some calculation. I'm like, how does that, <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. Like if you're starting with this and you're saying, for instance, nausea, and, and they're nauseated because they're pregnant versus they're nauseated because they have some cancer. Like, it just didn't make any sense. Post-intercourse syndrome? Or... <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I'm, <laughs> I'm just like, I don't understand how we're making these, like, assumptions. And, and it just didn't make sense to me. Because, like, for me, right now, I've been sitting for a while and my rear end's hurting. And, and I don't need to inject it because it's hurting. I need to get off my butt and I need to go move around and change my, you get a little variety. Anyway, that's kind of the mindset. I was like, empower people with skills to deal with the thing leading to the problem, not just injecting the so-called problem, which is just, anyway, that's another conversation. So I was questioning and then I was thinking, okay, if I want to do my own practice, seeing half the number of patients and not doing the injections, I couldn't see how financially I could sustain myself even if I worked out of my home and put a, sh a little shingle on my front door and like had them come see, like it just didn't seem feasible. So I just started doing part-time anesthesia and uh, you know, it's this whole process of being vocal about what we don't like in medicine. And I meet a gentleman who's in his sixties or seventies and we started talking and he'd mentioned his father in his nineties, still agile moving around. And I just love these stories. And then I just mentioned something. He asked what I did and he was moved by that. And he said, well, why don't you write a book? And I'm like, write a book. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, well, then, you know, fast forward two years after I started going to conferences, dealing with marketing, sales, personal development, creating products and learning all this new education that we don't learn in medical school. And I was jazzed. I mean, I, my husband will tell you, I get around people that are entrepreneurs, meaning trying to create value, not trying to be a, you know, a, you know, just looking at the money, but we're truly trying, <laughs> truly trying to change lives. My husband will tell you, I look like I'm on something. I'm just so excited and so just full of joy and, and so inspired, motivated and, and, uh, he always goes with me because he just loves how I, you know, get jazzed up about it all. So it's addictive and, it, and it's a, an environment full of optimism and spirit and uh, aligning your values with your soul. And um, I didn't know what it was at the time, but it just, I liked the way I felt. And so um, got the idea of 
pandemic and trademark that term that came out through a little conversation with four people were just brainstorming and not being afraid to share ideas and uh so from there all my online stuff started and um i've been on this journey of part-time anesthesia work and the biggest part of my next phase was i started no longer just working when i want to work and claim my hours i started taking on a permanent part-time position and over the following few years and then i got locked into this like routine and i i know my brain body spirit i don't like to be confined and told how to do things and um and so i kind of beat to my own drum and um, at some point, as of September of last year, my previous group and I decided we're no longer a fit, left on good terms, but I really struggled through those years of trying to, it's like I was trying to get to people to understand me, like, but I was not, I, I wasn't cut from the same cloth. There's like, it's, it's okay that we're all from a different cloth. I'm just saying that I was thinking and acting or or caring for patients that was was rubbing against the medical system in a way that not everyone liked. And that's where my biggest shift came that I wasn't willing, as in before, I wasn't willing to that golden handcuffs where you are making that money and it's kind of feels secure. As much as my soul wanted to be out of my own maybe do something pain related or wellness. I felt trapped. I felt, I felt I wasn't living in a little 600 square foot apartment anymore. I finally had a mortgage to pay. I still had some debts to pay off and I didn't want to take that step off the cliff. But when it came to it and both parties are like, okay, we need to admit something. <laughs> this is no longer a good fit. Then I, I had to go out on my own and it's really what I wanted, but I wasn't willing and I wasn't, I knew I was going there, but I, I was taking too damn long. So um, I'm glad I'm there now and I'm part-time independent doing my own thing, controlling the experience the best that I can with, with surgeons that really appreciate my approach. And I'm very grateful for that. And who knows where that'll go. Um, but obviously we're working together doing a podcast and we still have these um, dreams of helping people and, and ex exposing stories that can, can help people with this journey that can really be bumpy sometimes. No, absolutely. And, and thanks for that because, you know, I think we, we <laughs> you're getting this impression that you're like, I'm trying to do it. I'm kind of bouncing against the system and people are looking at me like I'm crazy or I'm, you know, that there was something wrong with me. But my suspicion is there's, it's, it's more that I think physicians don't realize or at least don't accept how sick the healthcare system is in a role where you haven't taken, again, these active steps. And we assume because everybody's doing whatever or the system's set up the way it is, that that must be the best way. I mean, it must make sense. Otherwise, it doesn't make, you know, why else would people do it? And, um, so my, my suspicion is there's probably a lot more physicians out there that were like, were more maybe scared or not sure, or, you know, why is this person doing this when the whole, the rest of the system just seems to be doing it and they're spending hundreds of millions and of uh, billions of dollars in this system. And so because they're investing so much money doing all this crap, that maybe that crap is the right thing to do, you know, rather than going with their gut and their values, which are saying something's really wrong here. Right. So I applaud you on that. And I think, I think, uh, I, I think that's going to be a commonality that we're going to hear in other physician stories of transformation is the same thing is yeah. the system so big. When you start to question it, you almost feel like you're crazy because yeah. you're like, how could this persist when it is doing so much, you know, just not doing things right. And again, um, there are many different ways that you can address this in both the traditional and non-traditional practice, but yeah, you've, you've had quite the journey there. So. <laughs> <laughs> There's always more difficult journeys out there. Yeah. But, but no, knowing what you know now, yeah. as you, you step in this fully independent realm where you are the, you know, the master of your destiny here and you have your foot in different puddles and, and uh, you're managing both, a, we call it your in, in medicine, 
right? You're doing mm -hmm. anesthesia, you're just doing it on your own terms and you're outside of medicine and you're designing written books and you're, you know, working on health and wellness things and having a podcast. Uh, so that's something on the other side. Um, knowing all this stuff, what would you tell yourself as you entered medical school? So you can go back in time. Mm. I think the, if I would have listened, that's the key. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning to be a better listener. Um, I think if I would have listened that, and I think, you know, when you really reflect on your life and understand, I mean, there are so many topics of why you do what you do and how your upbringing impacts you and um, this sense of defensiveness when you're trying to prove yourself that reflect back on who are you trying, who are you trying to please and what are you trying to prove? Because if, if either of those two are dominating your decisions, it's, it's probably not the right direction. And for me, I think there's so much that was part of who I was about the, whether it's family or, um, you know, I think it goes down to when I was really young uh, and this sense of trying to do the right thing and trying to please people in a subconscious way, even though you made yourself believe that it's, you just want to, you know, accomplish, but in the accomplishment itself over and over and over again, you're never going to be completely satisfied if it's always, if what your journey is, is all about tasking and achieving. Now it feels good. Like there, there's some benefit there, but this journey, we can read the quotes about it being about the journey, not the destination. But there's so many of us that are wired to check that list and get the next thing or make your resume look better or please the next people so you can get that job or whatever it is. But the hardest work that is, I think, lifelong for me and probably many others is that inward journey. And I wasn't willing to go there. I think what I would tell my younger self is have someone help you learn how to do your inward journey. Because your one choice that you make to go to medical school is technically a, a lifelong decision if you stick with it in some capacity, because you have all these years of training and the extension of that, which it's not necessarily a bad experience to have. It will influence a lot and give you value. But if it's not meant for you, or if the way that you want to do medicine is not what's in the typical, um, you know, cookie cutter way of just putting yourself in the medical system and working for some other employer or whatever, I think if you listen to who you are and you understand who you are, which I'm still in that process, much better than I was before, you will make better decisions and you'll have more clarity on what you can do with what you're good at, what you love to do, what is of most value to others and what gives you the most meaning. So I think that to me is the first and foremost thing is, is know thyself. And it's easy to say, it's so much damn harder to do and I think, I think some other people are really good at reflection, including, you know, my husband, um, other close friends of mine, they really know who they are. And I'm sometimes I'm, I'm not saying jealous, but sometimes I wish I had that capacity to, to, to have that kind of reflection in a way that they understand themselves. So that was kind of a long answer, but if you don't know yourself and you're just living your life on this facade of what you should do and just to make a living and make money it's you're losing on the value and the richness of life no and and uh, absolutely and and for a listener out there it's like and some people have done that they've, they've either made the choices or someone else made the choice for them or encouraged mm -hmm. them to make these choices and like you said if you're if medicine is a commitment the point of the change physician podcast is recognizing that commitment is actually overall good but yeah. you have to know really who you are 
in what you want in some way, shape, or form, some have some clarity there before you can, again, start being aware enough to make those critical decisions to create that change path for you. So I think that's fantastic advice. And uh, I, I think I could use the same thing. So I mean, <laughs> older you got to come to, to me. Uh, all right. Well, um, this has been a really great episode. As, as your co-host, it, it was an absolute privilege to talk to you. I learned some many things about you that I didn't know beforehand. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate you sharing with us. Um, so, but for the listeners, would you let them know of a book or other resource, something that has had the impact on changing your life or path as a physician or as a person? You know, I'm going to actually say that the, the non-medical books, because <laughs> as medical <laughs> physicians, you tend to read either research articles or books about medicine because you're always striving to know more. And, you know, it's just hard to know everything. Um, you do the best you humanly can do. Um, I think the things that have really inspired me and helped me change as a physician are different and you know not to call out any particular type of online leaders or anything like that but there there was some inspiration i remember the motivation manifesto by brendan bouchard um was just really it's a kind of a it's a nice little book it almost feels like a bible but it's it's it, it just looks different than your typical books that was extremely inspiring but even um I know and th this is actually kind of a, a medical book and I read it later and not too long ago, but the, the brain's way of, of healing and some of those, uh, I'm trying Norman to remember Deutsch. the author. What's Norman, that? Norman Doidge. He's a Deutsch. Those, just the power of change, changeability within, not just for like symptoms of stuff, but just the way the mind can change and shift. And, uh, the power of habit, Charles Duhigg, um, I think is a really good one. But there are so many non-medical books of people who are, and it may not just be a book, it might be a blog, or it might be just some story that I hear about or read. There, there's something about, um, or even some videos I've watched that really kind of click and I don't feel alone, or I feel like, wow, there's, there's other ways that I can like create something else. Um, so I think, I think that's, those are the kind of things I would say the biggest ones are non-medical people that, that open my eyes to a totally different realm. So I guess we can summarize that for a one book of resources to look outside of medicine because there's a lot more information out there than maybe some of us would have we either didn't know to begin with or we forgot about it while when we got sucked into that black hole of what's next what's next what's next and it and it may get you really excited about <laughs> life too literally I, I would agree with you i think that's a that's a great point there's so much more out there uh, and some really really just powerful stuff so yeah all right well thank you very much dr melissa katie uh, for welcome. joining us today on the change physician podcast the the, the podcast about when for physicians who want to find for more fulfillment in their life and traditional or non-traditional practices. Um, and so again, we hope that you all got some value out of this. I think there's a lot of lessons that you have in your own journey, Dr. Katie, uh, that I, people may see reflected in their own choices or perhaps they're at a difficult point. Maybe you're, you're struggling with the decision. Maybe you're not even aware that there's a decision to be made, but you're just really dissatisfied in how things are turning out. So with that, thank you for joining us today. Again, we hope you got lots of information. If you want to contact us and tell us and give us feedback on this episode or any other episode, or if you have a, a guest that you think would be a great fit for the show, you can just contact us through our contact information below. And until next time, stay well. And Dr. Katie, you have any final words for the crowd? No, I'm not my destination. It's still a journey. All right. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And until next time, uh, this is the Change Physician Podcast.